hi. Hi, Danabel. How are you? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank good. you so much. How are you? Excellent. Good, good. Happy to be here. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hi, Rafi. Rafi. Hi, hi. hi, Rafi. How are you? Good, good. What about you? Good, good. good. All good. Going on. Life goes on, I would say, with, uh, <laughs> with uh, all this, yeah. Oh, yes. I think it's a good, um, good opportunity for innovation, you know? Definitely, definitely. Um, I'm, I'm, I've, I've always said this. I've always said that uh, locally we have a lot of uh, potential. Uh, people need to be given the chance to innovate. And I think even through rough, you know, uh, a difficult time, this is the best time for, you know, uh, uh, people to actually innovate and come up with new ideas absolutely, locally. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, at some point, uh, e-learning was seen as a no-no. And now suddenly, you know, everybody is doing e-learning and probably in many instances, even here at the IDI, we're doing it better than normal offline learning, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. So I think the future won't be the same anymore with, uh, with the post-pandemic. It will just be a better version and more efficient version of doing things, I guess. Definitely, definitely. But exciting times, I would say, exciting times. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Nice, cool. So many are joining today. Uh, so exciting! Many are joining the event, the session. So in a bit, in a bit, we will start with this. Okay. Sure. Salam, Saeed. Barak. Salam. Good, good, honey. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Great to have you here. And Thank Richard, you. great to see you as well. And I'm glad you two know each other. So that's that's a step forward. <laughs> Less work for us. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And Rafi, I know you. Uh, I've seen you somewhere, honey. I've seen I, you, I yeah, maybe like <laughs> five minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying um, to find the best angle with the lighting, but it's facing some difficulty. Talking about innovation, we need special Zoom corners. <laughs> That's, uh, That's true. I mean, Saeed yeah. has it down with a banner, and uh, Donna has the logo. Yeah. So. We I've tried. I've tried noise. my best. <laughs> I've tried my best. <laughs> yeah. Roughly, we, I think we can. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I was saying moving on forward. I think you know. Um, uh, I was telling my wife. Now we need to make the sitting room smaller so we can have a, a, a media corner. <laughs> so <laughs> for Zoom calls and for trainings yeah. and you know taking You're you know a video. <laughs> That's a pillar, I would say. Yeah, I think everybody will have a Zoom corner at their uh, at their home, and some maybe standing desks, <clears throat> decent yeah. microphones, decent headphones. Absolutely, well, Ra yeah. Rafi, we will be we would be honored to offer you um, and DIDI. Well, uh, we're po possibly getting a custom designed uh, pod, which is acoustically designed, and it'll be in collab. So if you guys want to do your Zoom conversations from there. It's something for you to consider. It'll be completely isolated, lit, all of that. So oh, well, that's uh, wonderful. Well, Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. I mean, yeah, sometimes you need really to isolate yourself, especially when you have important meetings. And uh, <clears throat> there are always interruptions. I mean, wherever you are, at home, at where there's someone walking by, and you suddenly, it, it's not a problem, but sometimes you lose, you know, focus of what you're saying. So mm -hmm. it's always good to be in a pod. You know, you just gave me an idea. Imagine, imagine you have a meeting and you're in the mall and you want to conduct a meeting and you have this kind of a, a pod or a kiosk that you walk in, you plug in a, a USB stick, which is your uh, company background, and you just take the meeting as a Zoom call. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, <laughs> that would be or, an amazing or, idea. Or just uh, put a hat on yourself, like a 360 hat. You sit down, <laughs> you put the hat, halas, you isolate yourself from everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> so we are about to start now with the session. Yeah. Okay. So many sure. are in the room now. So good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to our e-library session with today's exceptional human books. Everyone's online now. So before introducing our guest today, let me share with you the concept of this project. So a library is a DID libraries project is spearheaded with our students. So this is the work also for our students. So the concept instead of 
reading a regular book, we will hear inspiring stories and advices from, you, from our human books about their expertise, their experiences, their knowledge that will inspire us in our journey towards the design profession. So in a long-term perspective, the library will maintain a website of this project showcasing the human books and their advocacy availability to support you whenever you need them in your research-related activities. So this will be a great opportunity for all of us to support each other's endeavors and advocacy. With our current situation now, we still pursue the project through this e-library session. So we made it online, interactive, and open dialogue between the audience and our human books. So our today's exceptional human books, let me introduce to you Saeed Alnufeli, the director of IN5 Innovation Centers. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank, Thank you. you so much for accepting our invitation. And then we have Rafi Chakarian, our DIDI professor. Rafi, thank you so, thank you. so much Rafi, for accepting. Thank and then, of much. course, Richard Wilson, our founder and executive director of Collab. Thank you. Good to be here. And, of course, it's also my pleasure to welcome our moderator for today, the ever supportive Dean Hani Aspor. Thank and you, Donna. Uh, Great to be here. So, maybe we'll start. I will start. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Donna, for the invitation and also for uh, organizing this event. I think this is the fourth one that we do and we wish to continue to do it once a week. Um, just so you know, this is just a place where we can introduce each other and meet each other. Um, we will be actually updating our database and having more uh, conversations with the human books so far and we will post them on our database, which is what we want to do so the library becomes accessible to the DC community. I'm very honored to have uh, Saeed, Richard, and Rafi today, and I think there's a theme uh, underlying uh, the, the expertise of our guests, which revolves around the making culture and the materials culture, and each one of them will bring in uh, their own uh, voice and approach uh, to it. I will start with you, Saeed, if you can just briefly tell us what is it exactly that you do uh, being the director of the N5 Innovation Centers? What does that mean? What's a typical day like for you? And let's start with that and then I'll go around the table and sure. the virtual table and ask. Yeah, Please go ahead. yeah sure. So, so um, uh, you know, uh, joining me joining the uh, uh, N5 uh, Innovation Centers is to support uh, the creative mind. So you're talking about startups, students, anyone who wants to create something and build a product or uh, building a business which is innovative. So this center is there for, for all these creative minds to come together and work together to build something. And this is why basically we're saying that uh, you focus on your business and we will take everything, uh, 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 care of everything around that. That's uh, starting from, let's say, uh, you having an idea, coming into you know our workshops that we do, the community that you're joining, uh, the uh, specialized uh, 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 spaces like the prototyping lab, the fashion lab that is coming up, and all this just for you to focus on that. Because I remember a uh, um, few years back when I, I didn't have the space for me to build my own uh, product and I really struggled. I had to go to my friend's house or find a place where we can build it or try and, uh, and get it from our, our, our university. And this is why N5 Innovation there, uh, N5 Innovation Center is there to cater to all this. So we start, you know, from business uh, setup, which is the license, visa, um, uh, the co-working space, and going on to the community itself. We just want to bring all these creative minds together to work together because you know every time we do a meetup or we do uh, a community event these people meet or founders or creative they actually build you know a gel together and talk about more interesting ideas that they can bring to the world and this is why we're here so this is my day today is uh, i'm supporting i would say precisely supporting people who are building things that no one has built before and this is what actually wakes me up in the morning every morning i'm saying that i'm going to support these brightest minds to bring something you to the world. This energy and you have this energy around you. And I love what you said, that uh, bringing people um, who have never done it before. And this is, this is what innovation is, basically. It's never been done 
before. This is beautiful. And then I turn the question, a similar question to you, Robert. Um, you must be getting a lot of people who haven't done it before, right? Or uh, experimenting at the edge of things. And I know that you have been pushing the, uh, the collection of material that you have to the edge. Uh, maybe you tell us a little bit more what you do, what is Colab, and how you are working on the, on the if you want, pushing the, the, the envelope of uh, our understanding of how material is, is, um, um, is uh, I don't know, stocked and used, and where, where, where are we going with that? Sure, thank you, honey. First of all, a pleasure to be here, and uh, great to obviously be involved with the IDI and support um, such a great initiative. Um, following on from what Saeed said, I think in five obviously do a fantastic job of bringing together creatives with ideas. Um, what we want to do as Colab is try and help them realize our ideas. So when it comes to material exploration, there's a lot out there being developed from all corners of the world. As Colab, all we want to do is we want to throw the spotlight on materials on ways of re-looking at existing materials. I think that's a very, very important uh, a thing. Um, there's so much of research and development that we can't necessarily keep up to date with every single uh, improvement. But as far as uh, Colab's mission is, we, we exist in Dubai to feed this thirst for knowledge when it comes to materials, when it comes to non-conventional materials, uh, when it comes to having a different outlook on uh, what is being done. I think for the longest time, the creative community, I use this word very loosely, um, were sometimes uh, handicapped by what's A, available in the local market, uh, B, also by time constraints, by lack of knowledge. Um, and then also a few of them might necessarily say, we do this, we've been doing this, we're happy to do this, and that's great. Okay, but there's a new generation of young minds, um, innovators who want to break the mold. They say that's been done, it's been tried, it's been tested. We want to push. As Colab, we just want to support um, their dreams, their vision, and uh, you know we we serve purely as a social business hub again to bring them together where they can actually um, touch feel, get an understanding of the materials. And once they do that, they're on their own journey of uh, discovery. This is incredible. And I apologize. I called you Robert. I met Richard. And uh, I want to say that this dovetails so beautifully into the infight culture. And it's really uh, incredible. So when before the talk, I so that you and Said know each other. And now I understand why, because uh, I mean, I, I could see how it is, but now after you explain what you do, as you said, that they'll be on their own. And I think there's in five, they can go there. It's not like, uh, yeah, you, you, you help them set them up and then they can go to in five. So technically they're not on their own. D3 is providing this incredible uh, infrastructure and this ecosystem between CoLab, in five, and um, and maybe to shift to Rafi now, uh, Rafi, maybe you can tell us about uh, your background, uh, you know, uh, in aerospace. And also, if you want, you can talk about the new course that you've developed for this semester, which ties, I think, neatly into uh, the discussion today. But I leave it up to you to introduce yourself to our community and. Uh, Tell them a bit about the IDI and what you're doing there. Okay, thank you, Hani, for the introduction. So <clears throat> I start. I studied industrial design back in Italy, in Venice, and one way or another, I ended up with uh, working with space architects and astronauts. That led me later on to develop my thesis, my PhD in aerospace design. A field that doesn't that doesn't exist. I mean, usually people hear about engineering, or uh, they feel uh, they they hear about uh, aerospace engineering, but combine it with design, it's something very rare. It doesn't exist. So later on, I when I moved from uh, I moved from Italy and I was teaching 
for the first time in Beirut in uh, the, air, the aerospace design and architecture courses at the uh, American University of Beirut. And we did it for a couple of years quite successfully. Unfortunately, uh, I mean, on the longer run, we didn't have the potential uh, to go ahead to, uh, let's say, and to take my vision of actually creating discipline uh, by, by itself. And that's where I met Hani, and we were teaching in one of the universities together. And one day Hani tells me, uh, Rafi, I'm, I'm leaving. And I mean, knowing Hani and the amazing conferences he was organizing back in Beirut, I said, how come, what happened? He said, there is this new amazing university that's being founded in collaboration with uh, MIT and Parsons, and they're doing innova uh, innovation and design founding new courses related to product design and industrial design that doesn't and multimedia things that for me it was like music to my ears because especially in the region you never hear about those things so i said oh wow so maybe this could be the perfect opportunity to to carry on my dream as well in aerospace design so that's where <clears throat> when i actually also moved uh, here to uh, to, to, to Dubai and realize that, oh, wow, here people actually have vision and they're really investing culture and resources and money to actually drive and become one of the leading nations in the regions in, in different fronts, but also above all aerospace. And that's where I also realized that, oh, we actually have one of the best fab labs uh, in, in the region with N5. In fact, now we're also uh, equipping it with robots and new, new machinery that will make us that it will make possible to carry on the studies and research of aerospace design in a, <clears throat> in a design uh, university. And also the community that in five is bringing in, in the region and in, in Dubai together, this bright minds, the amount of people I met over there that were doing amazing stuff from AI to water purification. So all the, let's say, leading topics uh, of the, um, during these uh, difficult days. So, I mean, I think that there's a very bright uh, future for us, especially in my field of aerospace design. And today I'm also developing, I'm a, a founding assistant, I'm an assistant professor here at the IDI teaching the foundation courses. But this year we started also the third year uh, of our courses and I have developed a new course, a workshop in design and manufacturing. And uh, it's one of the, um, it's an amazing course where students learn all about reverse engineering and the use of all the advanced, let's say production tools from foundry to, uh, to different CNC and metal production tools. And many of these tools, we actually have them in the Fab Lab. And hopefully when the COVID situation is a bit better, we will actually use all these tools to manufacture more innovative products on the line. Thank you, Rafi. And I, I would like to refer back to something Richard said. You used the word spotlight, to spotlight, in your case, on materials. And I think that with the three wonderful guests we have today, if we want to spotlight something, I think it would be the entrepreneurial culture that each one of them is supporting, whether through uh, through uh, the, the N5 uh, system, which is technically, I, I wouldn't say it's government, but it's not private in the sense it's not commercial. And then the collab, which is blurring the boundary between how we see, I mean, you own a retail space technically, but you are pushing that boundary of an, our understanding of retail and DIDI which is the educational arm. And I think that we all have something in common. And if we want to put the spotlight on entrepreneurship, I come back to you, Richard, and ask you, um, what type of people are coming to Colab? And um, if you can tell us a story about a situation where you were able to uh, bring in someone, they had an aha moment in your space. Um, because it is not traditional what you're doing and we'd love to hear more about that. Sure, I mean there are hundreds of stories that I could actually yeah. uh, go on about yeah. but I'm possibly going to just um, you know give you one example yeah. and it was a um, you know we we serve to exist architects, interior designers, fashion, design, fashion designers, manufacturers, anyone that wants to work with materials and wants to explore 
uh, new materials, right? So that's, that's how we exist. We operate as a social business venture. We're not for profit, uh, which is sometimes a little difficult. Nice. But we're thankfully blessed to be supported by the, 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 the wonderful infrastructure here. Uh, we get people, because we're located in, on the retail level, we get people walking in all the time. They're just uh, mm -hmm. interested to have a look. We were approached by a gentleman that manufactures and assembles in Dubai a very unique solution. Um, he makes cryo chambers for uh, horses. So whether they're uh, racing horses or endurance horses, and we're talking about obviously these are for uh, um, His Highness and, and, and other royal, royalty uh, members of the royalty who own horses and race horses all across the world. Um, I wasn't aware that cryo chamber um, is something that's used for horses as well. It's completely legal and it's safe. And, and he wanted to soften the, the chamber. Okay, I obviously don't have a picture of a chamber right now, but if you can imagine a traditional MRI chamber that we as humans enter, it's cold, it's metallic, it's, it's, it's not attractive. Um, he wanted to look at the interiors and the exteriors of this chamber and he came in and explored and in, you know, I would say five to 10 minutes, he had an idea to work with some of the materials that we represent here. But upon further uh, discovery, we realized that there is a local company in the UAE called Bia. I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, in Sharjah. Okay, and they make a material that he could potentially use. So I think this is very important to also spotlight that or, or throw um, uh, the attention on locally made uh, materials, local innovators that can offer a solution. It's not always what can we bring from the West or from the East. It's what's available here. And I think at this point in time, he's doing business with them and they're exploring uh, whether they could prototype the next chamber using some of Bia's materials. This is a surreal story. I mean, honestly, like it, it could be, uh, you know, reality is stranger than, than fiction, right? This is uh, so uh, strange and, and it's so interesting. And I learned two things from this. I learned uh, A, that when you enter your shop, which, or your display, your, your showroom, which I've done, it's overwhelming, all these choices. But I liked how you said that this person had something in mind and that helped him focus and then make sense of this array of things. So I think it helps when you go into a place like yours is to have an idea what you're looking for because then you can focus and then you can guide them better clearly and you, you clearly did and connected them with Bia and Sharjah and all of that. The second thing is that uh, I learned is that uh, the decision doesn't have to be final. Once they work with the material, they have to go through prototyping, which is, which is very important. And I turn the question of prototyping to now Saeed and to ask you to tell us about, uh, since you've joined in five, um, if you have any stories to share that uh, have this aha moment, like uh, maybe not as strange as a cryo uh, <laughs> compartment for a horse, but maybe you have something uh, fascinating to share as a story, because stories are a good way to understand uh, it better what, what uh, you have to offer and what you can what people can do with your offering. So Saeed, yes. if you have a story, yep. yes, yeah. Sure, so, so, so I'll, I'll put it simple because I, I came from experience and, and you know, over the years, uh, me uh, growing up, I came from an engineering background where you know, we used to, I worked in the telecom and then I moved into uh, system design. And from there, um, I worked with military to build tracking systems. And from there, you know, I moved into kind of uh, system design. And from, from that project, I, I, I was inspired to build my startup, which was, uh, we call it the Fitbit for Camels, basically a, a, a tracking device uh, 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 that to monitor data and capture from racing camels. And from there, you know, from this project, it's actually a hardware project. So I was doing, you know, my, my research in uh, Mustard Institute, and then um, I really struggled to actually design. Because one is um, we, didn't, we don't have many designers. And this is why uh, uh, DIDI is actually answering a big pillar 
of my own struggle. So from there, what I started to do is go from trying to find labs, trying to find. So the day I walked into N5 and I looked at our prototyping lab, I was like, I don't think, <laughs> I was telling my boss, I don't think you have any idea how important this lab is to innovators and designers. Because every time I, I, I invite someone who's building a hardware, he's like, this is heaven. <laughs> this is a heaven for startups who are building hardware products. Uh, this is a heaven for designers. This is, that's why, you know, because everything is there set for you. And we're trying, this is why we're trying to kind of build a community around the prototyping lab. And this is why it's important that, you know, having the students there, having the uh, entrepreneurs there, this is where the place where they can meet. And this is why I'm saying that for me, it was, uh, uh, it is very important to nurture this, the, this place because, you know, when I went outside UAE to try and find product designers, they really quoted me very expensive uh, uh, quotation. And, and it was like difficult, you know, here you have to raise funds, here you have to kind of, uh, and, and no one's gonna give you money out there unless, unless you have at least built a prototype that is actually working. So having this pro, uh, lab is very important and having the people around it to actually help you. And this is what we wanna build. So answering my, my part of the problem, yeah. that's yeah. why N5, coming to N5 and looking at this, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to build. So uh, a couple of, uh, uh, last month I actually, I've called uh, a group of product designers who are actually building products. And we sat down in a round table discussing, you know, how we can help entrepreneurs, how we can help the people who are coming into, uh, into the lab in order for us to cater to them. Because, you know, it's like people are wandering around going here and they are going outside UAE when we already have talent, but they don't have a home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, that's a beautiful story, side because it's very personal. And yeah. now with the uh, cryo compartments for horses and Fitbits for camels, Rafi, I think, uh, I don't know what to ask you uh, to tell us a story now that can, uh, you know, uh, top these two incredible inventions. So I don't <laughs> know what you have to say. Think about that, yeah, all yours. <laughs> Yeah. At this, uh, in this moment, I still can't get off my head uh, an Apple Watch on a camel, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we made it work, huh? Amazing. <laughs> yeah, we have. Yeah, we have yeah, many it, prototypes. It's an amazing uh, story, I mean, to monitor the live feed of racing animals from, from camels to horses. Uh, I didn't know it was a thing, but now I realize that, I mean, you have the culture of, of those uh, animals racing. And why not really invest the, the local talent to develop? Let's say, where bet, what better location in the world to develop the tech for that than yeah. Yeah. Imarat, where they actually invest on such, uh, on such things? Uh, for coming back to your question, Hani, I'm still thinking of... Uh, maybe of about Warta or maybe about Mars. I don't know. You have so much to tell. Uh, I mean, yeah, for... I mean, when, when you talk about innovation, as much as my background is in aerospace design, it's, it's good because these fields really teach you to become a better version of yourself. I mean, imagine when you're designing for space, it's uh, a place where it has no mercy, a single error and you can get people killed. You have no, you, you cannot have any waste in space. You know, when you're traveling, every single thing, thing is pre-planned. Every single screw is accounted for, is measured, is weighted. When you're living, for example, on the moon or in the future on Mars, the, the, the concept, the notion of waste will be, will be completely eradicated because, I mean, I'm, I'm sure many of you watch Star Trek and you know that there's nothing wasted. Everything is resynthesized. Re so... The, the same thing will uh, it, it will happen will, happens when we're doing, traveling to, to space. So why not learn, let's say, from these notions, from the, this type of research? Even if I'm, uh, we haven't been to space yet, or we haven't done any long-term uh, trips yet, we must learn from this type of designing and import that knowledge here on Earth to create better infrastructure for mankind to solve our energy problems, to solve our waste problems. I mean, here, 
we talk about recycling, but the, the notion of recycling for me is, is wrong because the problem is that there shouldn't be waste to begin, to begin with. And imagine the amount of waste we are constantly producing. So when you're designing for such extreme fields, you learn, you learn so much from it. So in part of the projects I was working in before in, in Italy with these space architects was also a project called Warka and that's the other extreme. So at some point we went on a mission to Ethiopia and we were, we were in the villages, in the remote villages. It was initially a tourism uh, trip, but then we realized that in the middle of nowhere, suddenly we see all these children running into us out of the bushes. They suddenly poof, come up and they're like uh, running into us and yelling in their own Amharic language. We, we couldn't understand. And we had one professor with us from, uh, he, from Ethiopia, from Addis. And he said, they're not begging for money. They're not begging for food. They're actually asking uh, you, you to give them your empty water bottles because these children and women are constantly traveling from one part of the, the village to another. They usually invest two, four hours of their daily lives bringing water from one village to, to another, transporting cooking water from one village to another. So it ends up that these women and children don't get any education because most of their time they are spending to, to do these tasks. So learning from the aerospace technologies that we were then developing, we said, okay, what can we do to help these, uh, these people. So well, how can we give them some knowledge to, to facilitate water production? So we ended up uh, creating uh, with the company I used to work with, Architecture and Vision, creating a, a project called Warka Water. Now it's an international project. And the Warka Water is a water tower made out of bamboo. It's around 14, 15 meters tall. And it uses a special coated fabric that's capable of harvesting water from thin air. So no machinery involved, no nothing involved. You use really local resources to build these towers. And then you can harvest the humidity, uh, the dew from the water, the, the rains, the fog. And this can really help the local villages procure their own water without having to uh, travel all those uh, all those hours every day and invest instead that time to actually improve their education. So this is a perfect example of how one extreme field could really uh, invest in, in another because the tech and the know-how and the, the, the efficiency, the, the, the efficient way of designing innovative solutions, it all came from space. So I would like to also uh, point this out for skeptics because I mean, you usually have them, they say, okay, people are dying, we have pandemics, why should we put billions of dollars in space? Well, I mean, most of the things that are surrounding us today, most of the tech, most of the knowledge is either coming from the military or it's coming from space, like your phone, the solar panels, a lot of the LED lights that's surrounding us. So I think this is uh, an interesting let's say, experience that I had while working in these remote areas. And it's such a noble cause, cause, Rafi, bringing water from, you know, thin air into communities in need, remote communities, and just using local materials. I think this is, a, this is an exemplary uh, story. We can all learn from it. And, and I think it needs to be the mission of every designer Instead yeah. of creating superficial and vain stuff, why not improve the daily lives of every human? Absolutely. Like, that's the best way you can invest your time as a designer. But then again, that's my philosophy. <laughs> uh, that, that's, uh, that's really beautiful. Um, I would like to open up to our audience uh, to get some questions to our distinguished guests. Um, Donna, how would you like to do that, please? Yeah, hello. Yeah, the audience can ask questions. They can raise their hands or they can send also in the chat box. Then we can facilitate the questions for, for our guests. So our audience, any questions from our audience? We have we'll some. ask everybody at once, yeah? Then because. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, while we're waiting for some audience to raise, yeah, there's, uh, there's one we question. We have a question. 
Yeah. yeah, we have, yeah, we have two Nisha, I, We have two questions from Nisha. What is your recommendation to develop design thinking in schools? So I guess this question is good for uh, for Rafi. What is your recommendation to develop design thinking in schools? And also to Richard, yeah. Uh, I think design thinking, I will refer this back to Hani because Hani has a very nice lecture about how design thinking is actually, or design tools are nothing but life skills. So when we're talking about design, it's not this fancy word that people use uh, to say, well, I have to go and study design to be, to be able to design something. At the end of the day, if you really analyze uh, the, 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 the topic, it's just a problem solving tool um, in, in, during your uh, mundane life. And do you have these six skills? I don't remember the skills, Hani, if you can, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to take over this conversation. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, basically, as you said, I mean, there are six key skills that we need to teach. And yes, I agree, Nisha, that it should go into high schools as we bring students into university and all our DNA is based on design thinking. So it would be great for schools to do. And the idea has the project design space. Uh, which has involved 100 schools in, in, in the UAE in the past year, uh, bringing design school, uh, design thinking to the schools. But I would then go back to our guests and ask uh, Said, for instance, like how, how would you say design thinking uh, works at N5 or Richard, how, how would it work uh, in your line of uh, materials knowledge? Yeah. So, so decide to start. Yeah. Please. Yeah. So I would say is uh, as you said, it's a, it's a problem uh, solving tool. Is how to kind of design something or come up with a with a problem or and solving it, right? And and for me, because I come from a research background, and before that I didn't have those skills. Even though you know I went to university and I graduated, but when I went into research, this is when I started to realize how to actually create an assumption and a, and a hypothesis and so on. So that's one form. Of, 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 of solving a problem. And, and today, when, when, when I speak to startups, when they come up with ideas, I say, okay, that's a great assumption, right? Uh, and they kind of take it like a, like a, like a set in stone, like, a, this is, like this is my idea I came with and it should work. And I'm like, listen, uh, you have this idea, you have this assumption, go and test it. Let the world tell you and give you the answers, right? And, and this is how uh, a form of, one of the forms of trying to solve a problem. So design thinking is one of them, but for me, I, I use kind of the engineering way of, of, of solving a problem is creating that hypothesis, and then I go and test it out. And, and, and you know, when it comes to technology uh, and the things that we're building, you always want that uh, uh, feedback from the, from the customer to come back to you so you can continue to iterate and solve. It's not like a, a, it's a coffee shop or it's a, it's a burger joint that you're opening. It's, uh, it's, it's something into innovation, right? You always have to continuously develop. This is how, you know, the likes of Apple, Facebook, all of them, they're actually using design thinking methods and hypotheses and solving in order for them to, to throw it out to the world and wait for, you know, feedback and then they continue to improve. And, and this is how I see it. And I time even like uh, I've met, uh, 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 you know, um, um, problem solving skills. And I think uh, when, it, when you're being taught coding, when you're being taught also design, these are uh, Said, I think we, I we think, yeah, you, I, think yeah. I, I got, I got disconnected, yeah. So yeah, just uh, yeah, just uh, just uh, finishing off is that these are the fundamentals that actually help you when it comes to uh, solving problems. Okay, great. Uh, do you want to add anything, Richard? Uh, um, yeah, question? I'm going to be a little controversial and uh, yes. first of all state that I don't come from a design background, but I sometimes think that that's a good thing because when you have an outsider's perspective, 
um, you can approach a problem or the industry from a from a from a slightly neutral, unbiased perspective. Um, one of the things that you know when I look at materials and especially uh, how designers want to necessarily use materials, a lot of designers or design focus nowadays is is on what looks good for Instagram or Pinterest or what could go viral. But could you actually build that with the materials that exist? I think that's a bigger part of the problem. You know, yes, we can design. Yes, we need to design for, uh, to solve problems. Yes, we need to explore the materials that we have access to and, and use. Mm -hmm. But can we actually build that design? That's something that I think um, a lot of people uh, seem to be designing just for the gram, as they call it. Um, so they say, yes, this is going to go viral. We'll try and get a Kickstarter. We'll get funding. And then um, the reality is that they can, can't actually build and deliver on what they, the initial concept. And it's so far removed from what was sketched or what was rendered. Because you can render pretty much anything, uh, but you not, not necessarily deliver on those fronts. That's, that's a very good point. And I go back to Rafi and, and say, um, how, how as an educator do you overcome this challenge where uh, the, the, the a person might have an idea, is able to represent it, uh, make a, a rendering of it, three-dimensional realistic rendering, but when they come to make it, what are the skills that they are missing to translate that concept from just an image or privileging the eye to actually the, the making of it, the actual making on it, of it. And how, how would you overcome it as a educator? I mean, obviously when you're designing a, a, a new solu sol solution, I mean, just to give you an idea, earlier on we were working also with N5 on this on this uh, AI mirror and we uh, exhibited it during the previous um, previous Dubai design week here in D3. And we had these mirrors that read your emotions and change color based on how you're feeling. And it was this robotic little uh, gimbal system that we, that we designed together with some in five members and it took us around seven to eight months. So we had the idea, but we didn't have really a clear idea of where, we, where we're going to end up. We just had, let's say, the idea of this is what we need to be building. And it took us eight to nine months and at least 15 different prototypes. And a lot of our own uh, money, a lot of in five, let's say, uh, investment that they dedicated a small budget for us to do all these iterations. So whenever you have a render, it, it, it's not said that your final project will end up looking like the render. Most probably, uh, it will not. In fact, if you see a lot on Kickstarter, sometimes, the, especially in the early days of Kickstarter, they would put these renders, but they wouldn't have the product. And suddenly, after months of development, the, the, the customers would get a product that didn't look anything like uh, what they had seen in the renders. So for sure, I mean, you will need a lot of time. You will need some, uh, some expertise from a product design perspective for at least to start doing your own prototypes. Because as a, as a designer, you, you just need to have a physical item to, 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 get some, to build some interest uh, on them, whether it is for investors, whether it is for a pro bono engineering team to put it together to actually later on take, uh, develop different versions of it uh, as, as well. So it will require some money, but it will require also a lot of iteration and a lot of time until you reach something that actually works or at least simulates the, the idea that, that you have uh, at hand. And once it does that, you can be certain that investors will board your train and for sure it will take off uh, from there. I'm not sure if I answered your question, Hani. Partly, yeah, partly, but definitely, I mean, uh, this is something that we work on a lot. Richard, and hopefully you'll have less and less uh, people that come without the ability to make. And that's, that's the premise of uh, our university, is to combine the making with the conceptualization and bringing them up to the same level. I see we have many more questions. So yes. Donna, yes, please go ahead. 
Yes, so we have um, some other questions here. So there's this one from Anna. In terms of design, Rafi had mentioned that ideal design should be in terms of practicality and application in daily life. So I'd like to ask that even for designs that don't seem very practical in current uses, certain designs are essential for the future development, even though they did not seem practical in the past, for example, Tesla. What's the take on this? I mean, the question is not that clear because me personally, Tesla has always been one of the most innovative companies out there. And also that's, the, that's partly why their technology is, uh, is successful. And although, for example, there, it's a hype now talking about Tesla, it doesn't still, they have one of the um, most advanced electric cars out there, but above all, they, their cars are actually open source, so the entire technology is open for other car manufacturers to leverage that and to actually work with it and improve electric cars. And one of the biggest problems for when it comes to, for example, Tesla or other electric cars is the battery and the battery life. That's why they, initially, uh, they are creating one of the biggest battery manufacturing plants in the world. So it's crazy how one technology ends up driving another, in this case, development. Of, uh, of batteries. So, I mean, um, I, I'm initially, yeah, they didn't seem very practical and electric cars in general, a decade ago, even more, there were a lot of companies trying to push that. However, I mean, the corridor, the technological corridor was still, from one aspect, it wasn't there yet. For example, the batteries, but from another aspect, it was too soon, it was too ahead of their time. That's why they seemed unpractical that the market wasn't ready, the oil guru, the, the industries weren't ready to let that share of market go away. But now uh, a lot of car industries, for example, are slowly realizing that, okay, that's the future. A lot of European nations are slowly implementing new laws to limit the fossil fuel combustion cars in the next 10 to 15, 10 to 15 years. And a lot of the big let's say car manufacturing companies such as GM are, try, are slowly trying to embark on, on the production of electric vehicles. So some things, even if they don't feel practical because they are outside of their time, eventually, I mean, it takes, it's a process that, that one way or another it will, it will happen because, I mean, it's the only way you can make a certain te some technology sustainable, even if today with, with the rate uh, it's not that Teslas are actually more sustainable than fuel, fossil fuel cars. They are actually less sustainable because the, 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 the amount of waste that comes through the generation of a Tesla is still much higher. But eventually, while we go, while we go ahead in time, they will become the, the main type of cars that we will use, the EVs. Thank you. So I hope, Anna, that answers your question. So there's also another question from one of our students. Uh, from Alvaro. So I guess um, this can be answered by Saeed or Richard. So as a student with interest in product design and its relation with technology, to what steps should I consider to work towards the need of the market? Can you repeat the question? I couldn't hear. There was a disruption. Sorry. So that's um, one, this is one for, from one of our students. So as a student with interest in product design, and its relation with technology, what steps should I consider to work towards the need of the market? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned before, is that usually um, we encourage the startups or people who are building products to engage their potential customers from the beginning. Uh, from my experience previously was we used to build products and then make them ready and then try and launch it. But now is this uh, lean method of trying and uh, engaging your customers early so you can get that feedback and keep on iterating your product. So I highly advise that if you have built a product that you want to bring to the market or you want to launch or something, you need to start with that prototype with, with the minimum features and then introduce it to your potential customers that you think that they're going to use it in the future and give it to them as a trial that they can actually test and give you feedback. Because from there, you're going to learn and then gradually grow that product. Don't focus on, oh, I want to launch this product and go to the market straight away. No, start testing from now 
as, as you get. And that feedback loop is the way you improve that product and, until it's ready for it to go to the market. And then you can decide either you build it locally or you go somewhere and you source, you know, the materials or, uh, you know, do it, uh, uh, go, go, go actually to uh, people who can actually manufacture that product. I hope that answers the question. Richard, do you want to add more? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I just, I think what I would like to add on to, obviously, Said covered it uh, beautifully, but I think, you know, as a product designer and, and, and looking at the needs of the market, I think anticipating the needs, the future needs, so you're not designing for today, you're designing, you know, with a view towards the future, towards looking at the needs of, of, of your market are not just today, but let's say four or five years down the line looking at the technology as well that would develop because technology advancement uh, and development is, is mind blowing. It's uh, we can't, we can't all keep up to, uh, to date with, with what's going on. So as a product designer, I think, you know, if you've got one eye on the, your future needs, and then secondly on the developments in terms of whether it's materials, whether it's the, the technology, whether it's the know-how, those are some of the factors that you'd need to be aware of to relatively, you know, try and ensure your success. Thank you. Also, uh, one more thing I would like to add, because, you know, when I was building the technology that I was doing is, um, um, uh, and relating to Richard's point, is that we always had to kind of research what's coming, what's new and so on. So at one point, we wanted to actually integrate our, uh, uh, the Google Glass uh, to our product is that, you know, the, the camel owners will have these glasses and they can actually see the data of the camels while they're racing. And we're trying to kind of integrate this. And then we realized that uh, uh, Google decided to retire the product because it, it was not successful. So here, you know, these technologies are keep on coming and it's, they're coming at a faster rate that you also need to kind of research what's coming and what's dying. Maybe Bluetooth is going to die in the next two years. You have to be aware and knowing that the, uh, this technology is dying or fading off. So you can move into the next and prepare for the future. So adding to Richard's point, that is very, very important as a designer or someone who's building a product. Wow, that's great. Yeah. So there's this one more questions. Uh, what are the three things you focus on in a business? So anyone can answer from this question. Oh this question what yes are i can answer that <laughs> what are the three things you yeah. focus on business so, so i say i would say that uh, for us as people who are uh, trying to support startups and especially startups uh, uh, when when people are building these businesses are highly risk comparing to other businesses um, and you know it requires a lot of investment so if you're a product that means you need more investment comparing to other businesses and also uh, the business model that you're building um, uh, let's say if it's technology uh, design, it's, it's, it needs a heavy investment. So here, um, of course, uh, we always look for, pe let's say, good designers, people with expertise, and also the founders themselves. This is a very, very important uh, uh, pillar that the team that you have around you, because this is, uh, and, and this is why when we look at, when I used to look at uh, 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 companies to invest in, or uh, people to give money to, I look at the team. Is this team have the right mindset? Are they, uh, can they deliver this product? And this is very, very important. I remember uh, when we first started is because uh, uh, me and my co-founder came actually from the industry, we thought that uh, people from the industry are, you know, the, they, they are the experts. So what we did is we brought a software expert and we brought him in and said, okay, uh, we want you to join our team and help us build this product. And the problem was that he was, he called himself an expert that he didn't want to learn anything. And now um, in, 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 in a space that you want to innovate, you want to learn, because here you're, we all actually are researchers, are researching about new technology, researching about new software that is coming, uh, researching on, about new materials that is coming. You really need to have an open mind and stop that expert thought because that maybe could have helped you in your previous job that you did great and you was paid uh, good money. But as an innovator, you need to keep on learning new stuff. This is why I say today, if you, you, you tell me, oh, say we will go to Mars, 
I am ready to do that because I know that I have that open mindedness of, of going to learn new things as I go. So, you know, learning is always, you know, there's a lot of people who, who stay in that path and say, oh, I'm an expert and I get paid for this. And there are people who are open and entrepreneurs, designers, they need to be open to new ideas to bring into the table and, and move. Maybe this uh, could be taken from another industry and brought to another industry and needs more design, more tweaking and so it to adopt to the new uh, technology. Any more questions? I think we have many more, but maybe we sift through them. Donna, uh, pick a yeah. couple. We're almost out of time. Uh, maybe yes, we yes. take one more because then I want to hear uh, final thoughts from our guests. Yeah, so this one more question. So with the demands with your work and everything in your daily, um, in your daily situation, how do you manage the challenges in your work? So Richard, Saeed, and Rafi can answer. Yeah, Richard. Yeah. Sure. Um, I, I say this, you know, I, I, very honestly, that collab, it's one of the reasons, it's, it's something that keeps me up at night because I'm worried, but it also is the thing that wakes me up in the morning and I'm passionate, I'm happy, I'm excited to come into collab every day and look at uh, what the day is going to bring. Um, we have a very, very um, different approach to how the space is run. So, you know, just given that the fact that we're a social business venture, money is not the ultimate objective. We're passionate about the vision and the mission of what we're trying to do. And the financial element of it, which worries us, will take care of itself. Okay. For us, it's knowledge is the cornerstone of what we're trying to provide access to that. Okay, we can't guide the designers, the manufacturers, or anyone that they should be doing exactly this. We don't have the answers, but we can give them the tools or the access to all of this information that exists out there. And you know, that pretty much is the crux of, of what we try to do on a day to day basis. Thank you. That, that's so passionate, really, uh, Richard. It's wonderful to hear that. You know, and I like how you said, what keeps you up at night and <laughs> what gets you going in the morning. I think that's so true. Yeah. Said, please. Yeah, so I would say, you know, uh, we, we get a lot of challenges. And I think um, um, uh, uh, challenges is what excites us. I know sometimes we don't want to look at challenges, but I think through these times is when innovation comes out, right? Uh, th there is a saying when they say uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So... Uh, th throughout uh, uh, a lot of difficult times, I think this is where the times that I actually innovated the most. So I think uh, challenges are there to be solved, and I think uh, entrepreneurs and designers love should should actually love uh, challenges because that's actually challenging you to 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 challenge actually yourself and 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 move your potential even higher uh, uh, to to solve problems. So I think uh, for me, challenge is uh, I would put interesting when someone brings a challenge uh, could be good could be bad but is actually uh, as human beings is something that we evolve and and grow uh, and grow as well so for me challenge is an opportunity i would say nice nicely said really inspiring here and rafi yeah sorry honey Your mute, Rafi. Yeah, can you please repeat? Sorry. Yeah. Honey. How, how do you manage the challenges in your work, Rafi, with your demands and pressure? Yeah. What challenges? I don't have any challenges. <laughs> oh, so you don't have any challenges. <laughs> I don't have any challenge. Every challenge is an opportunity, so I don't see it as an obstacle. I see it as a as a new way of doing things, as a new way of so of uh, boarding to those opportunity trains, you know? It's, it's, I think it's a matter of mindset ra rather than, I mean, you just need to have the patience, the courage and like board the train. And um, fortunately we are in an environment that's very, very supportive. And I think that's, that's fundamental. It's very healthy. It has all the resources, it has the right mindset. So whenever, whatever type of opportunities, I will change from challenge opportunity that you have, 
I think it, it can be easily uh, tackled. Yes, perfect, that's true. <laughs> Nicely said. I think uh, we have just time to hear final comments from our distinguished guests. I would um, then start the way we started in the beginning. So Saeed, any parting words, any words of advice for our community? Yes, so, so I would say just to kind of close off um, uh, that um, I think, uh, and my advice to students, because I was a student before and I was uh, 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 working on building something that no one has built before. It was challenging. Uh, it was sometimes that people never believed in my product. People who thought, you know, uh, you're insane that you're building such thing uh, for the industry. But I think throughout this, to, uh, we say you need to have thick, thick skin. And also uh, be, be ready to fail. Because I think if I yeah. would say something that I have learned, I have learned that uh, failure is something that I've always learned and failure is something that I'm proud of. So I've failed many times, I've tried so many things. And I know uh, a lot of the students are actually, you know, they don't have experience, they just came from school and so on. But I would say that try as much as things as possible because you know, me uh, reaching where I am today as a director of uh, N5 Innovation Centers, I've actually started as an engineer in a control center, right? And I've moved on and I've always loved uh, system design and, and, and building. And then I moved into military systems, building uh, military systems to equip military tanks. And this is all design and stuff. And then I moved into research and then I moved into building my own uh, uh, startup. So these are phases I never knew. If you ask me like uh, uh, 15 years ago, uh, say it, where are you going to be? I will not know. But trying all these things and getting that experience, then I started to realize that actually these are my interests. These are the things that I love to do. And, you know, failing, trying, failing, trying, meeting new people, new opportunities open up, new markets actually are opening up. So I think uh, all this there for you to actually pick what you like. So fail as much as possible, you will learn. And I like, by the way, um, uh, I saw uh, uh, recently on your social media, Rafi had, he said that he failed in school. And I actually, I, 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 I was so happy to see that because, you know, in our region, a lot of the time when, when, when someone says you failed, it's like a shame. But no, it's actually learning. And, you know, I remember in school, the people who actually failed are actually doing well. <laughs> Yeah, it's so surprising, yeah. But so because these guys had that setback and actually reflected in life earlier than the rest. All right, so these are my, my, my last words and advice. Said, I would like to put your things, uh, all what you said in two words, passion and drive. Yeah, I think definitely. these are the two fun. If you have this, all the rest is like doesn't uh, doesn't matter. If you do two things, you can, you're, you're a bulldozer. You just take on whatever plans, whatever challenges, whatever projects you have, you just, you have your to drive and you use your passion to, to, to take it ahead. Absolutely. Rafi, I will take those as your parting words. Okay, great. And then we have Richard, last but not least. Um, well, uh, thank you so much, guys. Um, I think, you know, mine's going to be similar to what Saeed said. And then it, it is a saying I didn't come up with, but it says, sometimes we win and other times we learn. Okay, yeah. I think for me that's very important um, as, as uh, you know, as, as fresh young minds, it's important to learn from every single situation. It's an opportunity to learn, it's an opportunity to grow. And I think um, in this current world that we live in also, it's important to be humble. As a young, the younger version of me was relatively, I have no shame in admitting this, I'm arrogant at uh, times and, 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 and very sure of myself. The older person is quietly and uh, is, a, is a quieter, humbler person because I can learn from my seven-year-old niece and nephew. I could learn from an 18-year-old student. I could learn from a 75-year-old uh, person. We always have to have that open mind to learn from others. Thank you so much, Richard. Such uh, beautiful words today. I learned so much. And uh, ending on a note of humbleness, I think this is a beautiful lesson for all of us. Richard, Saeed, Rafi, thank you so much. Donna, thank you for organizing. Thank you very much for
so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you, guys. You, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you for our, all our guests yeah. for being here with us. And uh, stay tuned for more exciting conversations that we will have. Ah. Thank yeah, but nice everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, very Thank you, guys. Are you Thanks for the invitation. Okay. Take care, guys. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.